Steve Nolinkin is joining us in studio. He is the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party. You're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. We're at 71. Bill Colley with you as well. Uh, we're on our way into the 90s today. And just a reminder, you likely now know if your air conditioning unit is working or not, or if it's got a few hiccups. If it's got hiccups, we recommend you give a call to Ramsey Heating and Electric. Uh, you can call the prof- professionals. We need to mention that the pros at Ramsey Heating and Electric. They'll make sure the job is done right the first time and set yourself up for a great summer. You can see them at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley or give them a call, 678-0459, Ramsey Heating and Electric, where they sell warm winters and cool summers. That's Ramsey Heating and Electric. Uh, Steve Millington, I I got a chance to witness, as I put it the other day on our website, uh, the sausage being made. Uh, People say that that's what politics is like. Um, but I got my first chance to sit in. I have been. I went to a state Republican convention in New York one time, and I got to meet Bernard Carrick and talk to him for a while. But other, I was. It was a different mode. I was working as a news reporter at the time, and so you know, it just really is a. It's a whole different atmosphere than I had from being down on the floor. Uh, and a lot of people who probably think that this is all fisticuffs, and it was actually. It's, it's just a lot of business it's like you know you put a resolution out there yay or nay and then next resolution comes up yay or nay and i think most people wouldn't be uh they probably wouldn't be too terribly entertained by all of that well it <laughs> this year the we took a lot of the drama and the entertainment <laughs> out of the process so and then that's a good thing we were able to get accomplished uh, what a convention is uh, set to do um, and there, there's two or three things we have uh, a primary amongst them is the election of new uh, state party officers to serve for the uh, following two-year period of time. <clears throat> and this year we were able to get that all done, and which took us a little longer than they planned, but at least we got it all done. And then the other thing is we have um, one uh, committee called the Credentials Committee, which is uh, uh, only exists for the uh, uh, process of seating delegates to the convention. Now, we only have conventions every two years. Now, we do have regular state central committee meetings every six months. So there's a difference there. The central committee members are predefined by virtue of the counties. The convention delegates are selected by the counties, but they do not have a permanent position. It's a one-time deal. You go to this convention in 2016, and then you have no more commitment. Um, in, in 2018, uh, you may want to go again, contact the uh, uh, county leadership, and they will put your name on the list and sort it out and make sure that we get a variety of people to go participate in the uh, election or the convention in uh, in 18. So th- there are two groups of people. One is, is pretty much standard all the time. The other one fluctuates. Um, Two years ago, and I hate to keep going back to two years ago, but okay. <laughs> two years ago, we went to Moscow, and, and we didn't get anything done at the convention. We got to the uh, credentials committee, which kind of validates the uh, uh, attendees, and, and things fell apart. They couldn't get it resolved. They couldn't get anything done. So the, the convention uh, in Moscow two years ago just collapsed, and uh, it was kind of a really bad experience. <laughs> so this time, they, they, they made several changes. Number one, every county had one of two choices. The state commit, central committee prescribed a method by which you could select delegates to the state convention. Follow this format. No exceptions. However, if you as a county would like to use a different format that basically agrees with the guidelines of the state, but you want to customize it somewhat for your county, you can do so and submit to the state two months prior to the selection date, which in this case, this year, uh, the selections had to be accomplished by the 21st of May. And so by the 21st of March, we had to submit a a change of procedures to the state for their approval, which we did. Twin Falls County, many counties did as well. And and so we said, okay, we're gonna follow your guidelines, except we're gonna change this point and this one and this one. And and, uh, the the state came back and said, 
uh, that's generally and basically within our guidelines, we approve it. So that become a posted uh, uh, exception. So when the Credentials Committee showed up, um, Twin Falls County had met all of the requirements for choosing a delegation. There was no challenge. And, and that followed pretty much across the board for all the counties. There was three counties that did have challenges, but they were uh, kind of nitpicky kind of stuff. They, people didn't get their two minutes to make their speech about why you should send me to the state convention. When in Twin Falls County, we said, we're not giving anybody two minutes to make a speech to go to state convention. We have to select 32 people in Twin Falls County at two minutes apiece. Um, will somebody please send out for breakfast? So we just, <laughs> just decided we're not going to do that. So no speeches. So here, here's the selection process, no speeches. And it, it worked well. Everybody got seated. They, I think the final number was they seated uh, 490-something out of 500 delegates. We've got more coming up with Steve Millington in just a couple of minutes. He's the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party, and it does appear that there is a little bit more unity coming out of this year's convention. We'll have more details on that coming up in just a few minutes at 71. You're listening to Top Story with Bill Colley as well on News Radio 1310 KLIX. Steve Millington is joining us in studio. He is the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party. He spends a little time with us on Tuesday mornings, and uh, we're recapping some events from the. Uh, the Idaho State Republican Convention, which wrapped up on a Saturday evening in Nampa at the uh, Idaho Center. And uh, call it right now, 843 and 71. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. You know, because we don't have a lot of. Uh, the, the work, everything's pretty well settled as far as state races go. Uh, so a lot of the focus I noticed over the weekend was uh, on the national race. Uh, the speeches, of course, from Mike Crapo and Raul Labrador really focused on that. Especially those two guys. And, and uh, uh, for the Saturday luncheon, we had a gentleman by the name of uh, Buck Sexton. Sexton. Yeah. Right. And, and he is a, uh, right now he's working as a fill-in on several of the national radio shows. He's been uh, uh, filling in for Rush Limbaugh. He's been on uh, uh, Glenn Beck show. Uh, I think they said he'd filled in once in a while for Hannity on his radio, primarily the radio side of the picture, not the television side. And and he gave an interesting uh, uh, talk about uh, the people who are proclaiming never Trump. And he said that's a bad idea and explained in some detail why it's such a bad idea, that uh, this is not something that we can just kind of let happen because it's not a four-year deal, it's an eight-year deal, in addition to which there would probably be three Supreme Court justices during that eight-year period of time, and, and that sets uh, a lot of judicial precedent for generations to come. This whole Trump controversy was stirring the whole time we were there, uh, but Sexton said in the Q&A that he thought that Trump was going to win, uh, and, and a lot of people out there say, well, that can't happen, but he seems quite confident that it's going to happen. I liked his explanations as to why it was going to happen and how it was going to happen. Um, he did put uh, some uh, through some cold water on the idea that uh, Hillary would ever be indicted for all of this email scandal stuff. He said, that's just not going to happen. Um, you're smoking some funny stuff on your lunch hour. Get over it. Uh, but he, he mentioned several things, and one of them was that there seems to be a great deal of, of uh, uh, discomfort among the voters about the way things are going. Where are we? Where are we headed? How is this happening? And why are we here? How did we get here? And and Hillary Clinton continues to uh, basically uh, present that same message of oh it's not so bad where we are let's just keep going further to the left. And he said I think there's a lot of people who are not too comfortable with that. Yeah, today I was reading a a piece in Bloomberg News where the writer said there's a new, the federal government has a new formula for looking at the economy. They take 14 factors, put all these together, and come up with one figure. And he said they've been able to go back in history and show that if they apply it in, in the past years, decades even, that it's a good marker of where the economy is going. And right now it says things are headed for a really bad state. And if, if the economy gets worse before Election Day, that favors, obviously, the uh, the Republicans. That's right. The the party which is out of office, so to speak, which would be Republicans. And 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 one of the indicators that kind of shook everybody was that, and I didn't get all of the uh, the uh, total details because I was in the convention Friday morning, um, 
and, and that was that uh, uh, the jobs report came out, and it was brutal, just awful. I mean, 38,000 jobs for the month. Uh, you know, we need about 120 to 140,000 per month just to pick up the new additions into the job market. College graduates, high school graduates, people joining the job market for whatever reason. And all those college grads coming out just now, in fact. Yeah, here we are. They're all uh, graduating and, and looking for jobs. And so what did we do? We added 38,000 new jobs in the, in the month of May. Um, that wouldn't take care of the graduates from a half a dozen good-sized universities. So now what do we do? Where do all these people go? Uh, and it's interesting, uh, one point that I thought was really fascinating was that the unemployment rate was still 5.0, if I remember right. It did not move upward at all. And and yet we've got all of these uh, high school people, graduates people and college the graduates. Force. They're not participating in the labor force. The labor force participation rate is still awful, just terrible. We can't, good gracious, that ain't going to work. We have a caller with us. Caller, you're on the air at 848 with Steve Billington, chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party. Good morning. Good morning, Steve. Um, um, the other day when I saw you on TV, I said, is that Steve or is that Tom Cruise? You look handsome, young man. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Another thing, uh, you just keep talking about Hillary's bobble and diamond and all this. And this has been going on for quite some time. But um, it's just an itch that I got, and I don't know if you want to. I mean, I respect if you don't want to. Um, opine on it, but uh, didn't George W. Bush had a server underneath the, the the White House, and they eliminated a million emails that were involved with the Iraq war planning? And I mean, that just kind of seems to... But I, isn't that uh, worse of a crime? I don't know. You tell me. Thanks. Never heard of that one. Uh, that's that's new to me also, and I'm, I'm sure we'll have lots of, of those kinds of... Of course, it was uh, in the White House where it was probably better protected, I suppose. Well, and, and, and the other thing that strikes me is that um, if these emails were directly involved with war planning or, or war preparation or war execution uh, things, that would be uh, understandable that those things would be deleted because it would be... Uh, not only a national security issue, but we're talking about putting members of the armed forces in harm's way unnecessarily because th those e kind of emails we right. do not want yeah. disseminated to anybody for any reason. And Hillary claims theirs were just about her daughter's wedding. So Yeah, right. We have another caller with us. Okay. <laughs> You're up next. You're on the air on KLIX with Steve Millington and Bill Colley. Good morning. Good morning, Bill and Steve. Uh, well, you know, what's happening is Obama's been implementing the transformation of this country using the rules for radicals from Saul Alinsky. And, of course, Hillary did her thesis on Alinsky. He dedicated his book to Lucifer, meaning Satan. So these are the kind of people we're dealing with. And I certainly agree that Trump is certainly not the first choice of many of us. But I guarantee you, look at the alternative. And But, you know, we our country is basically going down the tubes uh, in, in fast fashion, uh, because people are not getting involved, is for one thing, the political process, everybody just says, as long as I get my welfare check or have my favorite TV channel, you know, we've got to get more people involved. But Trump certainly has come out with some fresh ideas, whether he follows through them, all of them. But uh, I agree that we we have to support Trump because Hillary would absolutely finish this country off. Good point. There was a, uh, two or three of the people that, that expressed that, uh, of the guest speakers, of the guest speakers, and we had four wonderful guest speakers at the, at the uh, state convention. Uh, a guy named David, David Keene, uh, former president of the NRA, National Rifle Association, NRA, and, and he gave a very interesting uh, challenge about uh, we cannot become too relaxed regarding Second Amendment rights because they, the, the, the left, the, the progressives, the far left, are absolutely committed to destroying the Second Amendment uh, to the Constitution because how else can they take over if all of us have a gun? So it, that was an interesting approach that he used, that we, we need to have these, uh, these rights available to us. Um, his uh, his talk was uh, a little bit more uh, 
I don't know what you'd call it, uh, point specific. Uh, it was you you better pay attention to your gun rights and don't ever sacrifice them for any reason. Now, people talk about first choices. Uh, Raul Labrador's comments. Now, remember, there were 17 Republicans in the beginning of all of this. When, That's right. When he took the stage, he said, I just want to point out Donald Trump uh, was not my first choice. I had 16 before him. But then he said, I'm behind him now. And uh, and again, for the very same reason, because we're looking at what we're up against. And what we're up against is uh, the enemy of liberty. That, I believe that's the word he used, wasn't it? The enemy of liberty. And and uh, if we don't, if we become too complacent with that concept, we could, and, and one of the other things that he mentioned over, and, and so did uh, Senator Crapo, uh, we know that Idaho is going to vote for Trump. He's going to get our four uh, electoral votes. Do you have friends or or contacts or family members or in other states that you can uh, make a contract, reach out to, and encourage them to vote for Trump and explain why you are thinking this way? This is critical that we do this all across America, and and uh, they're not they're not looking at it very casually. And Senator Crapo, especially uh, in his remarks, he said we have. 40, no, 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 we have 34, 34 U.S. senators up for re-election this year. And if I remember right, he said 24 of them were Republican. So we have to defend all 24 of those seats and try to add at least two or three additional Republican seats, which is huge. That doesn't happen very often, and it, it's a large, large number. And, and uh, you know... Uh, that's that's crucial. That's vital. That the Senate will ultimately approve or disapprove appointments to the Supreme Court. Well, all federal court judges, but primarily, most importantly, the Supreme Court. And and we only have 53, 54 Republicans in the Senate right now. Um, it would be wonderful if somehow we could get that number to 60. But I'd be really happy if we had 55 or 56 by the 10th of November. It's 854. Steve Billington, our guest uh, this morning on News Radio 1310 KLIX, News Radio 1310.com. You're on Top Story with Bill Colley and Steve this morning. Go ahead. Good morning. Well, uh, you know, ultimately it comes down between Trump and Hillary. And uh, I just can't imagine how anybody would think that she is a better alternative than Trump. And uh, I know he's not polished or anything like that, but, you know, I know he loves this country. I know he was born here, and I think that he would, you know, his appointments to the Supreme Court would be a conservative, at least ways somewhat. Uh, I mean, just as much as Roberts, who's turned out to be a nothing but a turncoat son of a you-know-what. <laughs> Whoa, and, right. <laughs> and so my point is, uh, yesterday, you know, I've been listening to Glenn Beck for years, and uh, I would turn him on, and then the second word out of the, you know, I'd turn him on at any time during the day, and the, the second word out of his mouth was Trump, and how he was on him, and I think Glenn Beck's lost his freaking mind, but that's all right. But yesterday, he's still freaking out. He's still freaking out, and, it, and I just don't know why if Glenn Beck, why don't he bring uh, Trump in? And they have a truce. They hold Trump's feet to the fire and say, this is what we expect, instead of just beating the hell out of him day in and day out. I think uh, Beck is losing listeners because of it. I'll hang out. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, it may well be. I've it, heard a lot of cri criticism of Glenn from friends of mine. So have I. And, in fact, uh, at the convention, I was talking with a couple of people who uh, uh, seem to know that the process – uh, 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 Beck and his uh, Blaze organization. Sexton being one of them. Se yeah. <laughs> and, and they, uh, Sexton was much more cautious and, and careful in his comments, but you could detect just a little twinge of, uh, I wish he would kind of change his, his attitude about this a little bit. Yeah, this is getting a little old. And, and several people that I talked to just said, you know, this is over the edge. And, and, and lots of people want to talk about, we have to have a third party candidate. Somebody that can bring us back to these. And I say to myself, you don't understand the electoral college at all, do you? 
uh, a third, no third party candidate is going to get 270 electoral college votes. And, and you have this insane idea that somehow you're going to win three or four major uh, states, like, for example, a Texas or a With Florida. With no money or name recognition. And, and besides which, you can't even get on the ballot in Texas now. That deadline is passed. So you can't even get on there. And the objective was we're going to deny both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump the Electoral College votes and, and force it to the House of Representatives. Um, I got news for you, fellas. How many of those people in that House of Representatives are going to vote against the man who's currently is the presumptive nominee, but for our conversations, we'll just call him the nominee for the Republican uh, office. How many of them are going to vote against him when it comes to a vote in the House of Representatives, if it ever gets there? Not very many. We need- they have to go back and answer to their voters in two years. We're going to have Steve stick around for the uh, next segment of the program simply because lots of phone lines are flashing, and if you didn't get a chance to talk to him uh, in this half hour, he'll be around for the next 15 minutes in the next half hour. Yay, I'm on overtime. <laughs> <laughs> See Brad about that. Uh, 73 right now, 859. Steve Millington is the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party. Bill Colley with you as well on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. We've got more coming up. And I'm joined for a few more minutes this morning by Steve Millington. He's the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party, and he has uh, just returned from the uh, the state convention, and we've been having a discussion about that, of course, as well as uh, the, the big focus in that state convention, we pointed out, was on the presidential race this year. Uh, to be honest, uh, we have uh, we have <laughs> we have two members of the House of Representatives and one from our Senate delegation running for re-election this year. And they don't have serious opponents, so I think that the, the, the focus is on the national, on the national, and uh, and, and the now, unity. We, we do have several local state races that are going to have uh, pretty significant uh, Democrat challenges, and so from a state standpoint, we're focusing real hard on several of these people who we can uh, uh, elect a Republican uh, in uh, legislative races and in local county races. Uh, and, and that was real obvious in, in several of the smaller counties around the state. And, and in, uh, they mentioned, I think, seven or eight specific legislative districts that they want to go back in and, and control uh, or, or see to it that Republicans are elected. I have a good friend who is a state senator in one of the uh, legislative districts over in the Boise area. And, and in visiting with, with him, uh, you know, how we're doing, what's going on. He mentioned that two years ago in his race for a state Senate seat in the state of Idaho that pays 18000 bucks a year and has very little um, uh, huge name recognition or, or uh, upward mobility, his race between he and his Democratic opponent, they spent upwards of $250,000 in a... Uh, legislative district race uh, for the state Senate. And, and you know, the total vote count in that district was less than 18,000 people. So they spent $15, $15 per vote on campaign materials in that race. So some of these races get really, really contested, now here big in, time. In Region Five, for instance, you have a candidate who is running in Blaine County. That's correct. And he, uh, he, but he, he is up against probably one of the highest percentage-wise registrations of Democrats in the state. In the state of Idaho, that's correct. In fact, we have uh, uh, when we look at Legislative District Twenty, I think it's twenty-six, uh, and that's uh, Blaine, Camas, Gooding, and Lincoln County, which is show shown. Uh, the city of Shoshone, sorry. Um, we have a huge population of Democrats uh, residing in that area. We have uh, uh, Steve Miller, who's been elected to the uh, House now, I think this two two previous terms, so he's running for his third re-election. And, and this year, we have a vacancy. Um, the other uh, member of the House of Representatives retired, and so we have an open position there. So we, we do not have an incumbent battle, but we got two... Uh, um, new people running in that race, and and the Republicans are going to push real hard to uh, get uh, Alex Sutter 
boy, I'll be embarrassed as they'll get out if that's the wrong name. I, I'm pretty sure it's Alex Sutter elected into uh, that seat in 26. And then we have another gentleman, uh, uh, Dale Eberson, is running against, uh, oh, boy, the uh I don't care if Senate. you get the Democrat. You know, just it's, the... a, it's a Democrat. She has a senior <laughs> leadership position in the Democrats um, and, 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 and has been there for quite a while. She replaced her husband, uh, and, and is, she is really going to be tough to beat. So in that particular legislative district, um, we're challenging an incumbent, and then we have an open seat. We have one over in Pocatello that's an open seat, and, and they're all basically identified in what we would consider to be typically Democrat regions. Dale, on the other hand, and of course I give him credit, he's driving a rolling billboard, and he's already got strong name recognition there. So if you have to run against a powerful Democrat with a lot of Democrats in the district, you, you find someone who, people sometimes say, well, why do you pick that candidate? Well, because he's he's got tremendous, apparently, name recognition he in does. the area. <clears throat> he's, he's been there a long time. Um, I, I think he is in the insurance business or real estate business or both. And, and, and so he has a good name recognition and, and been a solid player in the community for a long time. So he should do, uh, he ran against, uh, I apologize, I can't remember her name. Uh, ran against her two years ago and, and did reasonably well. But in that particular legislative district, um, e even Steve Miller as an incumbent, you cannot take any of that for granted. You've got to fight tooth and nail right to the last minute because it is you're encroaching in a Democrat-controlled area, or a prominent area, and, and so you have to just fight like a wild man, clear to the end of the, the race. Just can't stop for anything. Twelve minutes now after 9 o'clock. We have a caller with us, and you're on the air with Steve Millington, the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Thanks a lot for giving up your weekends and spending all that time and money uh, going over to Nampa. But I'd like to make a suggestion that the Republican Party run an ad in the Wall Street Journal and USA Today and list all the union workers that are denied being work on the Keystone Pipeline. Rod busters, teamsters, iron workers, carpenters, laborers, etc., do this, and we can get the get the union workers and their families to vote for the Republicans. That's a good point. Uh, a few years ago, I was involved in a uh, some arrangements with a, a couple of three fellows, and and we went to uh, the border between North and South Dakota, and and we traveled up there regularly, and and it was amazing to me. We went past a a, a supply depot, and and we all said, "Holy Moses, what is this?" And so we inquired uh, when we stopped for lunch, you know, well, what's this out here? And they said that is all of the pipe that has been uh, purchased and shipped here in preparation to build the Keystone Pipeline. And, and it was a huge lot of, of uh, large diameter pipe. I'm guessing 48 inches or thereabouts in diameter pipe. Just unbelievable. I have not been back up there the last two or three years. It would be interesting to see if it's still sitting there waiting to go to work or if somebody has moved it somewhere else. But our, our caller's right. You know, I get so tired of us thinking that we have to be dependent upon foreign countries for energy sources. We don't need to be that. We can do it right here in the United States and, and, and do it with, with uh, uh, allies that are on our side. Speak the language. Speak, yeah, right. <laughs> so he, he's got a good point. And, 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 and put high-paying jobs to work. Crucial. We have to do that. One more thing before I get fired this morning. Yeah, you got about five minutes. We had a speaker on, uh, was it Saturday lunch? Uh, Kimberly Friday, Strassel. Friday. Friday. Oh, Wall Friday Shepper. Yep. Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal uh, uh, editorial writer. And, and she has written a book entitled The Intimidation Game. I think that was the title of the book. If you remember back in 2012 when uh, um, Frank Vandersloot from Idaho Falls became a major money uh, contributor to Mitt Romney, um, the Obama administration went after him tooth and nail. And, and the, the IRS uh, challenged him and... And uh, he had he spent millions of dollars defending himself against the IRS 
and the Food and Drug Administration, and it, he listed off about 10 different government agencies that tried to take him down. Well, as part of that process, somehow he became acquainted with this Kimberly Strassel, and, and she said, how can this happen? And he said, it happened this and this and this. So she flew to Idaho Falls and spent two or three days interviewing him and, and going through the details and researching it, and she found about a dozen other people. And she has written this book, I think it's entitled The Intimidation Game, and basically what it is is that the, the uh, uh, campaign reporting laws, which basically says if you uh, give money to a political action committee or a nonprofit committee or any of these kinds of things, they have to publish uh, the list of, of supporters. So what happened was they took this list of names and, and targeted all these people against Mitt Romney. And, and uh, she interviewed him and, and used his story as the basis for her book. One of her thoughts was, we have to be law-abiding, we have to meet the requirements. But think about this. All of these requirements where we must list in detail everybody that contributed money to campaign organizations of any kind, we are giving the opposition, and in this case, the Democrats, a com literal war chest of people that they can go after. And she listed two or three companies that, that, uh, that the, the liberal media has attacked. Uh, she mentioned the fellow from California who gave money to Proposition 8 in California, which was the... Uh, he got fired. Uh, I, I, he did get fired, and he was one of the founders of the company. I apologize, I can't remember his name, but I think uh, people can recall back how that happened. Uh, the media got after him so strong and so vicious that he actually got fired from the company that he had set up because he was considered to be um, anti-gay. And, and she said, we need to be careful about doing these kinds of things because the enemy is using that information to intimidate us and use social media against us to the point where that we cannot combat that effort. And, and she used the Frank Vandersloot situation uh, very, very forcefully in, in her, uh, but was not him specifically or singularly, but she had several other examples in the book. And uh, that book will be available, I think, in within the next week or 10 days. I don't remember. Did she say that June 21st or 20th or something? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Now, you got to remember, she's a, she's a girl from Oregon. Uh, that, that's right. Grew up in Oregon. A excellent background. Thanks, Bill. She also said that when she was a kid growing up and th that her family was so disgusted with the way government worked in Oregon, they always said, we're going to be moving to Idaho. That's right. She <laughs> <laughs> said that more than once. In fact, she joked that she said, I'm going to take some pictures and, and and send them back to my dad and tell him I finally made it to Idaho. <laughs> but, it, you know, it, it, one of the resolutions that we discussed in the resolutions committee was that we needed more transparency on, on campaign contributions and campaign filing. And as uh, it got defeated um, for a variety of reasons, and one of which was probably that I didn't present it as thoughtfully or as carefully as I should have. I did have to present two of the resolutions, and both of them were defeated, by the way. So don't have me do that for you. <laughs> but as I thought about her remarks, I thought to myself, maybe we're going about this all wrong. We might want to make less transparency so that they don't have a war chest to come back and fight us. And, and, and she said we, you know, she didn't say we needed to uh, completely eliminate it, but her idea was we need to be careful how we approach this thing because they are using that information as a weapon against us. Got a few seconds left. When is your next uh, county meeting? Uh, tomorrow night, Wednesday night, June the 8th, I believe it is, 7 o'clock at the uh, Twin Falls County Zoning Conference Room. That's in the new Twin Falls County West Office Building. Uh, used to be the old Magic Valley Hospital, but we'll be right there at 7 o'clock in the Zoning Conference Room tomorrow night, as a matter of fact. And we will discuss, uh, Grant Lopes was on the Rules Committee. He'll talk to us. We had two people on Credentials Committee. They'll talk to us. The Platform Committee failed. I was chairman of the Resolutions Committee. We'll talk about that in a few minutes and, and talk about how the uh, convention went in total. So great opportunity to uh, catch up on more convention items tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. It's 20 minutes after 9 o'clock. want to thank Steve Billington for joining us at 74.